namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the, call us the late summer and fall semester of our course. (laughs) Okay, and now, if you've been keeping track of the outline for the program in the study of the Majjhimunikaya, we have stud- completed the study of a group of suttas that are concerned principally with the development of the mind or the purification of the mind through meditation. We took the Maha Chattarisika Sutta, which gives us the 117th Sutta of the Middle Length Discourses. This gives kind of broad overview of the Buddha's path according to the formulation of the Noble Eightfold Path. Then we took the Satipatthana Sutta, studied it in detail. This gives extensive explanations of the most important system of mind training in the early Buddhist discourses. Then we took the Anapanasati Sutta, which gives a more detailed explanation of one of these methods of mind purification, the meditation on breathing. Then in the greater discourse to Sakaludayi, Sutta number 77, we did a detailed study of all of the different groups of training factors concerned with meditation in the early Buddhist teaching. The groups that make up the 37 aids to enlightenment, the kasina meditations, the eight bases of mastery, which also called the eight bases of transcendence, the eight liberations. We gain the supernormal powers. <laughs> And at times we touched on final liberation, but we didn't do any kind of detailed study of the type of wisdom that leads to final liberation. We know that wisdom is the third component of the Buddhist training. Moral discipline or virtue, concentration, and then wisdom. And so now... With this section of our program, we come to the cultivation of wisdom, or panya. And the preparation for the development of wisdom is undertaken by establishing right view. And so for this reason, in today, beginning today, we will undertake a study of the Samaditti Sutta, which is the discourse on right view. This is Sutta number nine in the Majjhimanikaya. Okay, this Sutta is spoken by the Venerable Sariputta. The Venerable Sariputta was amongst all of the Buddha's monastic disciples. He was the one who was pronounced the disciple foremost in the development of wisdom. The Buddha had two chief disciples. One was the Venerable Sariputta, the other was the Venerable Mahamogalana. The Venerable Mahamogalana specialized in the iddhis, that is, the supernormal powers. 
So he was able to multiply his body very easily, to dive in and out of the earth, to fly through the space, to battle with the antagonistic forces, the demons who were antagonistic to the Dhamma. And he was able to battle with them and defeat them, sometimes with hostile negative energies manifesting as demons and dragons. But the Venerable Sariputta, it seems, did not give very much attention at all to these psychic powers. According to the commentary, the commentary says that when he attained arahatship, these psychic powers came into his possession automatically as part of the achievement of arhatship as a chief disciple of the Buddha. But in fact, in the Theragata, Sariputta says that he didn't have any interest in the psychic powers. And in the suttas, we never see him exercising these psychic powers. But Sariputta's specialization, the field where he excelled, is Panya, wisdom, a particular kind of analytical wisdom. And so the Buddha did not have to deal with extensive analysis of particular topics in his teaching, but often the Buddha would just give a general treatment of a subject and then he would pass that subject on to Venerable Sariputta And Sariputta would take that subject up and then analyze it in detail and show many aspects that were not treated explicitly by the Buddha himself. For this reason, when a new branch of Buddhist learning began began to emerge perhaps a hundred, two hundred years after the passing of the Buddha, a branch of Buddhist learning called the Abhidhamma, Buddhist legend, attributes it to the work of Venerable Sariputta. It regards Venerable Sariputta as being the one who elaborated the Abhidhamma regards the Abhidhamma as originating from the Buddha and Sariputta as the one who systematized and developed and schematized the Abhidhamma and set it in the form that we have now. Personally, I don't think that this can be regarded as historical fact, but what probably happened is that within Sariputta's circle of disciples, this analytical treatment of the doctrine spread and then as one generation gave way to the next generation, that analytical mode of treatment became more and more systematized and then it was ascribed back to the time of the Buddha and Sariputta was regarded as the architect of the Abhidhamma system. Before we go into the sutta itself, I want to give a little background story about how Venerable Sariputta came to the Buddha. Because this is, I think, very important for understanding the sutta, this sutta, the Samaditi Sutta itself, for understanding Sariputta's approach to right view. I mentioned just before that the Buddha the Buddha had two chief disciples, Sariputta and Moggallana. These two disciples in Yeah, these two disciples had been friends even in their boyhood. They both came from Brahmin families. A 
Okay, they both came from Brahmin families that were closely associated with each other for several generations. And when they were boys, they were friends. As they matured, their friendship developed. And when they were young men, Okay, when they were young men, one time a festival was being held in the city of, or outside the city of Rajagaha. It was called the Hilltop Festival. This was like a big entertainment for the people living in the city or the vicinity. And so people would come from all of the surrounding towns, villages, to see this entertainment. There would be actors, dancing, singing. In those days, they didn't have television, didn't have internet. So for entertainment, one would have to see these groups of traveling, like traveling circuses, traveling entertainers. And so on the first day, they bought their tickets. And since they were from wealthy families, they got maybe first first-rate tickets. They came up, they were sitting, watching the entertainments. Both of them enjoyed themselves tremendously. And so on the second day of the festival, they bought tickets again and they went to see the festival on the second day. And so when there was a comedy, they would be laughing. When there would be singing, they would listen very attentive to the singing carried away by the music. When they was dancing, they would enjoy watching the dancing. If there was a kind of drama, they would be absorbed in the drama. Okay, so then they decided to go back on the third day. So then they bought tickets for the festival on the third day. Then while they were sitting there, first in Sariputta's mind, a young man, maybe early 20s, there came the thought, what is the point of watching this entertainment <laughs> in a hundred years from now, even less, all of these actors, singers, dancers will all be dead. <laughs> They'll all have to go their own way in this round of samsara. And in a hundred years from now, I myself, or less, I myself will also be dead and have to go my own way in the round of samsara. So what use is this entertainment going to be for me as I pass on from this life to the next life? Better that I should leave this worldly life and seek a path to liberation. Okay, so Sariputta was thinking these thoughts, sitting there when the singing, when the comedy was going on, he didn't laugh. When the singing was going on, he had no interest in singing along. <laughs> when the dancing was taking place, he just sat still in his seat. He didn't sway his body with the rhythm of the dances. When the drama was going on, he found it bored. His mind was wandering to these thoughts that troubled him. And Mogalana, sitting there, had exactly the same thoughts. <laughs> and so, when all of the plays and entertainment were finished. They were walking out of the theater together, both rather glum. And so Mogalana turned to Sariputta and said, What's the matter, my friend? You don't seem very happy today. Didn't you enjoy the festival? And then Sariputta said to Mogalana, Do you know, while I was sitting here, I was thinking, 
that these mundane entertainments, the joy, the pleasure they give, is just trivial, lasting just for a moment. And we, enjoying them, we're just like cows being led to slaughter, being given some delicious grass to chew on, to eat while it's moving to the slaughterhouse. And when Sariputta said that, Moggallana said, you know, I've been thinking exactly the same thing. And so Moggallana then said, what, are we, what should we do? And Sariputta said, let us go together and try to find an enlightened master to teach us the way to the deathless, the way out from this round of birth and death. Moggallana said, but our parents, they have plans for us (laughs) to marry, to continue the family. We're Brahmins. They want us to maintain the family rites, the rituals. Sariputta said, it doesn't matter. We can't be slaves to family tradition. What's most important for us is to find the truth. And so each went to his own home, packed a few belongings, necessary belongings, and together they left their homes and started wandering all over India, seeking an enlightened master, going from one place to another, sometimes meditating with one teacher, discussing philosophy with another teacher. Sometimes they would go temporarily, they would go separate ways, but they had made a pact, an agreement between them that Whichever one found the path to the deathless first would not go off by himself, but would first tell the other so that they could cultivate together. And so after traveling to many places, visiting many teachers, they didn't find any with whom they were really satisfied. But eventually they came back to Rajagaha, They're close to their hometown and they found a teacher whose name was Sanjaya in whose teaching they found some satisfaction. It didn't really give them the way to liberation that they wanted. But it seems Sanjaya had a very sharp intellect and so it must have given them some intellectual satisfaction since they were staying with him. Okay, one day they set out on their alms round, setting out for alms, and they went in two different directions. At a certain point, they parted ways and went in two different directions. And as Sariputta was walking, he saw an ascetic walking slowly, mindfully, his eyes cast down on the ground, carrying a clay bowl, his body so light, so radiant, every step so mindful, so consciously taken, that he was deeply impressed by this ascetic. And he thought, this truly must be one who has achieved the goal or is one who is definitely on the path to the final goal. This ascetic that he saw was one of the first disciples of the Buddha. He was a disciple named Asaji, who was one of the group of first five disciples 
and who had already achieved arhatship. So he saw this ascetic Asaji walking from house to house, collecting his alms food, and he realized this monk is on alms round. This isn't the time to trouble him with questions. And so Sariputta waited patiently until he finished his alms round. Then he saw him stop at a certain place, spread a seat under a tree, take his meal, finish his meal, and Sariputta just waited patiently. When he knew that this ascetic had completed his meal, he came to him and said, Friend, I have been watching you, and everything about you has impressed me. Truly, I think, you are a wise man, one who has realized the deathless, who is attain the goal. Tell me, who is your teacher and what is the teaching that you follow? Then Asaji said, my teacher is the son of the Sakyan clan, an ascetic that is named Gotama. We call him the Buddha the enlightened one. And I am a follower of his teaching. Then Sariputta said, what is his teaching? Tell it to me in detail. Now this Asaji was not a very voluminous speaker. He was very restrained in speech. And so he said, and he was also a very modest person, very humble. And so he said, as to his teaching in detail, that I cannot explain to you. Then Sariputta said, now a little impatiently, he said, then don't give me the teaching in detail, but tell me the essence. It's only the essence, the core of the teaching that I need to know. Then Asaji recited a stanza which has become engraved in stone right across Asia. Throughout almost all the monasteries in India had the stanza in stone and as Buddhism spread from one country to another that same stanza was engraved in many monasteries, written on the walls of monasteries, always became, it was considered the quintessence, the essential summary of the Buddha's teaching. In Pali, the verse goes, Ye Dhamma Hetu Sambhava. Ye Dhamma Hetu Pabhava. Te sang hetung tatagato aha yo cha te san cha niro do evang vadi maha samano. I'll write this on the board. You should copy it, it's very important. Okay. Ye Dhamma Hetu Pabhava. Okay, whatever Dhammas, whatever things there are that spring from a cause, that arise from a cause, Te Sang Hetung Tathagato Aha. The Tathagata. 
tells their cause. Yo cha te san cha ni ro do and that which is their cessation. Okay, the Tathagata speaks of that which is their cause and of that which is their cessation. A vang vadi mahasamano. Such is the doctrine of the great ascetic. Okay, and when Sariputta heard this verse, it said that even when Asaji had recited just the second line that the Tathagata speaks about the cause of things that arise from a cause, at that moment, all of the dust that was covering his wisdom eye fell away and there arose in him the dustless, stainless vision of the Dhamma. He saw into the ultimate truth of things and he reached stream entry, sotapati. And so by the time the verse was finished, he was standing there as a stream enterer. And then he asked Venabalasaji, where is our teacher (laughs) now residing? (laughs) Then Asaji said, He's now staying in the bamboo grove right outside the city of Rajagaha. And then Sariputta said to him, you go on back there. I have a friend to inform about my discovery. So then Sariputta went to meet his friend Mogalana And when Moggallana saw Sariputta coming, immediately he saw that Sariputta's face was now radiant, calm, his faculties very controlled, his whole manner was so different from the way he had seen him previously. There was no longer that look of anxious searching, but now that expression of his, on his face was that of somebody who had discovered. And so when Moggallana saw him, he said, What has happened to you, my friend? It seems, could it be that you've discovered the path to the deathless? And then Sariputta told him everything that had happened. And Sariputta recited the same verse to him, and when Moggallana heard that, vo- that verse, as soon as he heard the same two lines, his delusions fell away and there arose the stainless, spotless vision of the Dhamma and he too became a stream enterer. And so the two of them together then went to the bamboo grove and when the Buddha saw them Coming in the distance, the Buddha was sitting, surrounded by the company of monks. And when the Buddha saw them coming in the distance, he called the attention to those monks, to the, to his monks. He said, do you see those two ascetics coming? And the monks said, yes. And then the Buddha said, those two ascetics will be my two chief disciples. And then when the two ascetics came to the bamboo grove, They immediately prostrated on the ground at the feet of the Buddha and the Buddha said to them, Come, monks, 
lead the holy life for the complete destruction of suffering. And then they, just that saying of the Buddha that that was counted as their full ordination. And so they became bhikkhus. Then one week later, Moggallana, practicing continuously, achieved arhatship. But Venerable Sariputta took two weeks to achieve arhatship. Not because he was, not because his mind was more sluggish than that of Moggallana, but in order to become the chief disciple in wisdom, he had to explore and investigate many more things than Moggallana. Okay, now the reason why I want, I, I gave special emphasis to this verse is because, as we will see as we go through the sutta, that the whole sutta treats right view in terms of the same pattern of things arising through causes or conditions and ceasing with the cessation of those conditions. But let us go to the very beginning and take, start going through the sutta itself. Okay, we're now on page 132. We start at a time when the Buddha is living at Savati in Jeta's Grove. But here it is the Venerable Sariputta who is addressing the community of monks. And he says, friends, bhikkhus, and they reply, friend. And then the Venerable Sariputta said this. Now he uses the word samaditi, samaditi, but here, if we know, if we follow the paragraph itself, we could see that what he's talking about is not just right view, but a person of right view. So a person of right view is also called samaditi. So the text says, one of right view, one of right view. This is said, friends, in what way is a noble disciple one of right view whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Okay, so this paragraph introduces the theme of the sutta and it does so in a way which we say narrows down the general topic of right view and gives it a very specific meaning. But first I want to take right view in a general way following the explanation in the commentary. Okay, the commentary says that right view can be of two kinds. There is, you call it mundane right view and supramundane, or I like to use the word world transcending, lokutara, chu shu jian, jiang, jiang jian. Okay, the way we'd understand it, or we should understand this treatment of right view, 
is that there's two divisions of right view, two kinds. We call the mundane right view, which is the view of the working of the law of karma to understand that our actions are good and bad actions, our wholesome, unwholesome actions produce results, produce effects that correspond with the nature of those actions. To understand, to accept that our morally significant actions don't simply disappear after we perform them, but that they have some continuing influence, that they remain with us, and that after death, these actions will manifest in some form, that the life process will continue, and our actions will manifest in some form, producing favorable or unfavorable results. To understand this, to accept this, is to have right view, right view about the workings of the world, the moral process within the world. Okay, and this right view, at least to some extent, is common to, it's not exclusive to Buddhism in any way. Though I would say that it's explained more extensively, more convincingly, in greater detail in the Buddha's teaching than in any other religion or philosophy that I've seen. (laughs) Okay, the other type of right view, which is the especially important one, is the lokuttara, the supramundane or world-transcending right view. This is the right view that leads to liberation, to final liberation. And this is the right view of the four noble truths. This is the right view that the Buddha has put as the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the right view that gradually develops through the practice of developing vipassana, developing insight. But first it begins conceptually through learning, through reflection. And so we have two grades, two types of world transcending right view. First, there is the right view that is called the right view that conforms with the truths. This is the right view that is in conformity with the Four Noble Truths, the right view that is in harmony with the Four Noble Truths. Okay, we might think that if we study the Four Noble Truths, we learn them, we can teach them, explain them to others. We might think that we have the right view of the Four Noble Truths. No, we don't. (laughs) What we have actually is such anulomika samaditi, the right view in harmony with the Four Truths, the right view in conformity with the Four Truths. That is because we don't actually have the right view that comes from seeing the Four Noble Truths. The true right view is not just ideas, not just having concepts about the Four Noble Truths, but it is the right view that comes through seeing, indirectly seeing, clearly, all four noble truths, including the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Okay, and so 
right view in conformity with the truths would be the right view that is had by ordinary disciples, ordinary followers of the Buddha who have a good conceptual knowledge of the teaching. Even disciples who are maybe quite experienced in meditation but haven't yet reached the actual realization, the planes, the experience, the attainment of realization. Okay, but as one goes on, usually for most people it's a process of practicing, purifying the mind, developing insight. When the insight becomes clear and sharp enough, then it will pierce through the barriers, the obstructions of ignorance. Those blinders of ignorance fall away just temporarily and there comes the direct seeing of the Four Noble Truths. And that is called the penetration of the truths. Or also it's called the breakthrough to the Dhamma. Dhamma Abhisamaya or Dhamma Pativeda. I think it's Shen Guan. Fa Shen Guan. Fa Shen Guan. Shibuja? Shen Guan? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you understand my speaking, it's enough. Shen <laughs> Guan. Not necessary. <laughs> Unless there's somebody who knows Chinese who doesn't know those characters. <laughs> okay, so with the penetration of the truths, one then becomes, one changes from being an ordinary disciple to becomes a trainee one in the higher training. Technically, this is called a seka, one in training. I think it's Yoshwe. <laughs> Yoshwe, Yoshweja. Yoshwe, yeah. Okay, and so the trainee is one who constantly has this right view that penetrates the truth. That is a right view that can never change for a trainee, can never fall away from that right view. An ordinary disciple, one who has a right view in conformity with the truths, can still fall away from right view. If somebody comes, say, sometimes people have been studying Buddhism for a long time, they study the teaching, but then if there might come some impressive guru with psychic powers from another spiritual path and then shows the psychic powers, sometimes if the person is impressed by psychic powers, they might follow that guru, then they lose the right view. So that's why it's important to always try to keep very clear and strong right view as long as one is still an ordinary person with a right view that is simply in conformity with the truths. But once one has reached the penetration of the truths, then the right view becomes unchangeable, unshakable. And then the person who is a trainee develops that right view, cultivates it, 
from one stage to another, beginning from the stage of stream entry until that right view blossoms into full understanding. And that marks the attainment of arahantship. So the trainee, we could say, has direct knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, but not yet full knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. But the Arahant has direct knowledge and full knowledge in that his knowledge has completed its functions, all the functions. Okay, now taking the words of the sutta here, the opening words when Sariputta introduces the topic, He says, one of right view, one of right view. In what way is a noble disciple one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma? What type of right view is he? Describing. Excuse me? It's world transcending, but say it again. It's the right view of the seka, the right view of the trainee. And there are certain key words here which indicate this. Okay, to say that he's one of right view. Actually, I should say, according to the sutta, it's one minimum seka, but if we see the way the sutta develops, it will also include the arhant. But it's specifically, I would take it most most specifically to refer to the right view of the seka. Okay, we take the word of the text he is a noble disciple as one of right view, whose view of straight, whose view is straight. The word straight is basically another way of saying that the view is right. But here straight indicates that the view is really looking at things directly, not going off to the side. And so this is seeing things very clearly, not Diao Dian not upside down or (laughs) topsy-turvy. And then, this is the the important expression, who has perfect, maybe perfect is not such a good word, but I'll keep it, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma. Here the Pali word is avecha pasada. Avecha pasada, I'll write it, but it's usually translated, it's explained by the commentary as achila pasada, which means unshakable confidence. Yeah, the word avecha originally it comes from a root meaning to go with a prefix meaning under ava plus the root i
So the verb avecha seems to mean having understood or having undergone in the sense of having undergone a particular experience. In this case, it would be the experience of seeing and knowing the truth of the teaching. So a Vecha Pasada is confidence that comes through this experience of seeing the teaching, knowing the teaching. And that confidence becomes unshakable, unbreakable, unwavering. There are, according to other suttas, there are supposed to be four factors that constitute a stream entra. One of these is unshakable confidence in the Buddha. So the stream enterer doesn't look to any other spiritual teacher but the Buddha. Then unshakable confidence in the Dhamma, the teaching. Unshakable confidence in the Aryan Sangha, the community, spiritual community of noble ones. And then the fourth is firm commitment to the observance of the five precepts. Okay, so here, when the text uses the expression one who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma, it's using that a phrase which is regularly used to designate a factor of stream entry. So this is one of the constituent factors of the stream enter. And then it uses the last expression, who has arrived at this true Dhamma, who has come to this true Dhamma. It indicates or it suggests somebody who has just come. So that's why it seems that the whole paragraph is specifically indicating the right view of the stream enterer. Okay, so with this introduction, then the monks say that they would come from far away to learn from the Venerable Sariputra the meaning of this statement, and they ask him to explain the meaning in detail. And Sariputta says that he will explain. And we'll start the explanation next time. Okay, if there's any questions on anything covered today, any comments also? And we'll Yes, could you explain the confidence the precepts? The precepts. What the text actually says is that it's not confidence in the fourth case. It says that he is endowed with the virtues dear to the noble ones and that he observes these unbroken, un, without blemish, without any flaw, you can say, without any flaw. So the common understanding is that this refers to the five precepts. But the basic, I would say, yeah, these are basic moral precepts. Say again. Uh, as a trainee, yeah. someone who is 
That is so. The trainee is somebody who has achieved stream entry but has not yet achieved our hardship. In terms of the four stages, it would be a stream enterer, once returner, non returner, or somebody who is on the paths leading to those to the higher attainments, but not yet reached our Did you spell uh, Asana? Avecha Pasada. Avecha Pasada means unshakable or unwavering confidence. Ava plus E. Yeah, I'm sorry. You see, this is Ava plus the root I. That's just the letter I. I'm just showing where Avecha is derived from. This is really for (laughs) students of Pali. (laughs) Yeah, so you don't have to worry about Ava plus I, but the important thing is the word Avecha, which means, originally it means having undergone, but the functional meaning, the way it is used, understood in actual usage, is unwavering or unshakable. Janet? No, I think that's a misunderstanding. They, they say this is a sort of stock expression of showing, to show that they're very eager to hear the teaching. So even if they're living regu- there regularly, they say, indeed, friend, we would come from far away to learn from the Venerable Sariputta the meaning of this statement. So it's just general. It's not that the monks would travel to speak to each other. In this case, it's not that they were traveling, but it's just a way of showing that they would be that they're so keen to hear this that even if they were living at a distance, they would come to hear it. Yes? Right. Yeah. I think better to leave these questions until we go through this sutta and come to some of the other suttas where those questions will become more relevant. I want the questions to be pertain only to what I've covered in the talk. And I, we just have time really for maybe about four more minutes. Mark? The verse that I... The translation. Ye dhamma hetu pabhava. Whatever things there are that originate from a cause, te sang hetung tathagata aha. The tathagata, that's the Buddha, explains or t- tells their cause. Yocha te san rodo. And that which is their cessation. Evang vadi mahasamano. Such is the doctrine of the great ascetic. Literally, thus speaking, is the great ascetic. And as we go through the sutta, you'll see when Sariputta takes up any topic, 
he's treating it in terms of what is this Dhamma, that is the thing itself, then from what does it originate, that is describing the cause, then how does it cease, describing the cessation, and then he'll bring in the Noble Eightfold Path as the way to its cessation. I'll ask a question. <laughs> when Sariputta heard that verse and could achieve stream entry so quickly, we read the verses, oh, that verse over and over. How many of you never heard the verse before when I recite it? How many <laughs> got even some direct insight into the Dhamma? Any hands? <laughs> or are you just too modest? <laughs> Why does this happen? In what way would you say direct experience? When you hear it the first time, um, it just makes perfect sense that um, there's a solution to pain. Solution to? Well, he didn't hear it directly from the Buddha. He heard it from the Buddha's disciple. They were very impressed with him. Excuse me? They were very impressed with him. So, they would have more of an impact. I think that would be one factor. I think it's the fact that they had heard this before in previous, in previous lives, perhaps. Or, so, to hear it at that moment... That might be a factor. I'm not sure. Okay, all of these seem to be things. I don't have one. It's not that I have a right answer and I'm sort of testing you. In my view, this is just my understanding, that it's probably sort of the intensity of Sariputta's search. Sort of his mind was caught in, in Zen. This is what they call the great doubt. <laughs> so that he was really like searching, 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 searching. And he had all of his faculties were just very ripe. And it was just like the key that was missing. And when Asaji spoke that verse, that gave the sort of key. And then the mind just broke open and then the insight arose. Okay, we'll have to stop now. Okay, we stop by sharing the merits. Think of all the devas, the Buddhas, Nagas, and all sentient beings. Then we share the merits with them.